Hi there, my name is Memo. This is my channel, House Planty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me and in front of me today. I talk about tropical house plants. And I don't think today's plant needs any real introduction. Today I'm going to be reviewing the Phalaenopsis orchid. And obviously, this is a continuation of the plant review series. And I thought today I would go with one of the most quintessential house plants that most people can probably get even in supermarkets at the moment. But we'll touch on that in just a moment. Before we get into anything else, let's lay down some ground rules. So if you're one of the regulars and you're coming back, welcome back. <laughs> you know the deal at this point. If you want to skip to your favorite topic, you can by clicking on the chapter on the progress bar down below. Now, if you are new, welcome to the slight insanity that is this plant review series. And I'll start off this kind of ground rule section like I always do and just kind of say that there is no way for me to make this review unbiased. It is my biased opinion about my specific plant growing in my specific conditions. Now, normally, the people that have been here for a while will know that most of my plants tend to be in the conservatory, which is what you're seeing behind me. And obviously that's in the UK and whatever it might mean in terms of heat, cold, humidity, all of these things. This, however, and especially for the people that have seen the plant tour video that I did a couple of weeks ago, or a few, probably a couple of months ago at this point, is actually sitting behind me as I work in my office against a window. So this is in regular household humidity. It's not in any high levels of humidity, and you can see it is a very happy plant. I also think, if I'm not mistaken, that this is quite an old plant at this point. But before I start rambling on, let's move into the first section. So background with this plant, and I caught myself there before I started giving you the story. I'll give you the story now, however. So again, based on what you saw in that house tour video, this is one of many Phalaenopsis orchids. And I'm pretty sure the Phalaenopsis orchid, if I'm not mistaken, is also called the moth orchid. And I would imagine it's possibly because of some of the blooms, and I'll bring it in a bit closer so you can actually see. At the moment, most people by this point would have probably already seen a Phalaenopsis orchid. You can see the back of it as well because you know me, I like to show you the crispy bits as well. And yeah, we've got some dried kind of aerial roots there. I'm pretty sure they're called aerial roots on orchids as well. As I've said, every time I do any video on orchids, I am not an orchid expert. And I know there is a whole section of people that are orchid experts. Don't come for me. This has just been my experiences with this plant in my conditions, essentially. So learning as I go along here. But you can see it's got one, so it's got one bloom here, one same flower spike, so it's coming out of the same kind of element there, and it's just split off into two branches. There is another branch there for this specific flower spike. There's a flower there, and there's some flowers there, another flower spike. So in all, there are three flower spikes, two of which are new, and one of which is a rebloom from a spent flower spike. But yeah, the background on this is this is one of many, many blooms, blooms, one of many orchids or moth orchids specifically. I do have many orchids of different types and different species specifically, but this is one of many Phalaenopsis orchids that I've got. And the story behind that is as follows. So I moved to the area of the UK where I am probably about eight or nine years ago now, and the title of the video will have this. And the first moth orchid that I got, or the first Phalaenopsis orchid that I got, was pretty much within the first couple of weeks of being here. So some of these plants that I've got might be two, no, I don't think there's anybody, any, any one of them that's as young as two. I think the youngest I have, this isn't the youngest one I've got, but the youngest one I have is four years old, and I think the oldest one I have, which will be the title of this video, is eight. So <laughs> I've had these for a while. And they're always interesting because anybody who's not really into house plants at some point or another has come across an orchid or has been given an orchid. And whenever they come into the house, they'll be like, how are you getting these to bloom? And I will get onto that into accessories and care. But there are several of them now. I think I probably have, and I'm trying to think, 
probably six, seven or eight total Phalaenopsis orchids. Is it a bit excessive? Yes. Do I need that many of them? Probably not. There is a good reason why I keep as many of them as I do, and I will touch on that in just a bit. But essentially, it kind of became a thing that people got for me as gifts. So the first one was a gift. I'm pretty sure I don't think I've actually bought one for myself. It was just people giving gifts. And it's interesting because my whole kind of reigniting my passion for tropical houseplants and all of those things, again, in the recent years, and part of what started me on the journey again, and part of what got me to get to the point of creating this channel and doing these videos for all of you, was that original Phalaenopsis orchid. I kind of got back into it. I'd never really got into Phalaenopsis orchids. This is something that my mother loved for years, still does. She still can't get hers to rebloom. <laughs> she also, I am my mother's child. She also doesn't listen when I when she asks for some advice. And I'm just like, this is what I do. You've asked me for what I do with mine to get them to rebloom all the time. Oh, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just like, okay, why ask? <laughs> I can be very similar at times, so I am definitely one of the child in that respect. So I can't judge her too much. But yeah, it is one of those things that kind of really got me back into it. And I kind of gave myself a bit of a challenge, get an orchid to rebloom, because I was never able to do it either. So I did a few things and I did, and it kind of built up my confidence. And the more orchids I was kind of gifted, the more I was getting comfortable with it. And it was mainly because I moved away from a lot of the traditional advice that you would get about keeping a Phalaenopsis orchid. And I kind of fell down a rabbit hole of people that are really into orchids and researching what they were doing with their orchids. And that's when I really started to get a bit more comfortable with it, essentially. And I was able to get them to have loads of foliage loads of blooms. The other thing that I will say about the Phalaenopsis orchid generally, and this is something to bear in mind as well, is that for a large chunk of the year, the blooms aren't there. You're waiting for the next flower spike to come out. So you need to be okay to a certain point. If this is a plant that you want to get and keep for a long period of time, you need to be okay at looking at relatively unremarkable, I'm not going to lie, succulent type leaves basically because that is predominantly what you're going to be seeing and there are other orchids out there that do have slightly more interesting foliage and I'll add one at the top there I can never remember the name of it that I've got that does have it's a paphiopetalum orchid so I think that's commonly called the venus slippers or lady slippers or it looks different than the phalaenopsis orchid in terms of the bloom but the really interesting thing about that one and I know there's this, those are plants that kind of plant shops, more so than kind of the average supermarket or big box stores will bring out, does come up on occasion throughout the year. And the leaves have got, I want to say variegation, it might not be, but it looks, a, it's similar to the Calathea network. So it's got kind of squares, it's got like a checkerboard kind of pattern to it. So those leaves are quite interesting to look at because it gives you more than just a green leaf to look at, basically. So there are other options. The other thing that I will say about Phalaenopsis orchids, which I did not know and I have found out in recent years, is that a lot of the Phalaenopsis orchids that we've got in the market at the moment, pretty much most of them don't really have a scent. But I think the original plants that... I don't know if, the, if it's the right way of saying this, the original plant of the Phalaenopsis that we know and love these days kind of originated from, I think did have a scent. And I'm pretty sure it was kind of selectively bred for ones that I would imagine might have been a mutation somewhere along the line, which didn't have a scent. I might be entirely wrong with this. Do correct me. I know you will, but do correct me down below. But I'm pretty sure I did kind of either on a podcast somewhere or through articles find that there's a lot of Phalaenopsis orchids, probably not the ones that we're getting in the market, that do have a scent. Now, it's interesting that it's selectively been bred to not have a scent. I wonder whether or not it's maybe a similar situation as with some, why maybe some of the Hoyas didn't get as popular as they could have been. Because for people that know a lot of the Hoyas, even the more common ones, I'm thinking the Carnosas and all of those ones, basically, when you get them to bloom, sometimes they do have a scent, but it can 
be a bit off-putting to people. I don't mind, but it can be a heavily floral scent that most people don't necessarily want in their house. Don't get me wrong. There are orchids out there that are scented. And I'm thinking of the Lady of the Night. I can never remember the name of it, but I'll put it at the top there, which I've been trying to bloom for years based on Matthew and Stephen's advice from Plant Daddy Podcast. I still haven't got it to bloom. That one has a jasmine-y, lemony kind of scent. So I'm assuming it's probably why people have kept it because I'm assuming it's quite an interesting scent. If this, if the kind of original scented Phalaenopsis was heavily scented and it was very like a heavy floral, like you get sometimes with some of the Hoyas, I would imagine it can be a bit cloying. I know some of my Hoyas, I'm just a bit like, some of them are great. I'm just like, ooh, what scent is this one? But some of them are just a bit like, oh, it's no offense intended with this, but it does smell a bit like kind of old lady perfume, that kind of really heavy floral scent, basically. So that might be why, but I'd be really curious to actually come across a Phalaenopsis that has got a scent, because I would love to experience that, just, just to see what it might be like. But I think I have prattled on far too much for the background section. Let's move on to the next one. So coming into speed of growth with this one, and generally speaking, and I'm not going to lie, a Phalaenopsis orchid can be, depending on how you benchmark it, it can be a relatively slow grower. So if I was to kind of compare this to something like a golden pothos, not growing in here, but growing in a household condition, because I do have that as well, that might bring out two or three leaves as well. I mean, I don't see much of a difference between conservatory conditions and household conditions for a standard golden pothos. Uh, that's two or three leaves in the summer and the kind of growing season a month, this might bring out a new leaf during that period. And that's fast because in the winter, it might bring out a new leaf every two months or every three months. And it does take a while for it to kind of bring out leaves. Generally speaking, and this is what I have found, if it's bringing out a flower spike or multiple flower spikes, it will not be bringing out a leaf at the same time. And the people that have kind of had other house plants that get blooms and they get foliage, like I'm thinking some of the anthuriums potentially, you might have noticed something similar, or at least if there are still foliage, if there's still foliage that's being produced by the plant whilst there's a flower kind of growing, the foliage will either be a bit more diminutive, so a bit smaller, or it will take a bit longer to get there. And it is because a lot of that plant's energy is focusing on pushing out these blooms which kind of makes sense because essentially what it's trying to do at that point is reproduce. So it makes sense that it would be pushing out those kind of the energy towards the blossoms. Now, if you do not have a flower spike, you do tend to see the leaf growth starting to speed up or actually in the case of, at least in my experience with my Phalaenopsis orchids, that's when you will get the leaves growing at all. Because generally, if there's got a flower spike going, there might be a new leaf that's emerging. But it really, again, based on my experience, it really doesn't do very much until that flower spike is kind of reached its potential. It's bloomed predominantly, got most of its blossoms. Obviously, you'll usually have um, kind of blossoms that might be at the tip that might still be going. But that's generally when you'll see the, the leaf start to come out. And again, it will be relatively slow because there's, there's energy still going towards the blossoms. When they all drop down is when you get heavily, not heavily, but faster growth on the foliage of this plant, which again, as I've said, is probably going to be something that you're going to be looking at for the majority of the time you're going to have this plant. It's not blooms. Just bear that in mind. But yeah, uh, is it fast? No. Is it painfully slow? Also no. So it's kind of somewhere in the middle, but you need to be patient with this one. Now, coming into ease of propagation, and I'm not going to lie, I have never propagated a Phalaenopsis orchid ever in the whole time that I have it. Based on what I conceive and what people have attempted, I can talk a bit about what I've seen. I've never actually done it, so I can't give you any actual real life experience for me. If you have, do let people know down below. I'd be really curious as well, actually. But with this specific type of orchid. I think you can do this with a lot of orchids, but when you get something like a flower spike, I think, and I'll see if I can bring it in so I can show you, you might be able to see, I'm assuming these would also be called nodes, 
on an actual orchid. So you can see on the flower spike, there is that thing and there's a bit of a bump. So again, I'll bring it a bit closer and hopefully it won't focus on me. And you can kind of see it there. It looks like a little leaflet that's kind of stuck to the stem there. You would, again, this is what I've seen. You would peel that back slowly or find a little blade and kind of like take it off. And it, I think it then exposes a node. And what you can use is something called a cakey paste. I'll add it at the top there. I don't know if that's exactly how you pronounce it. And essentially it is kind of a, a, a gel kind of substance, which if I'm not mistaken, has got some form of growth hormones, I think, in it. And what that does, it is activates that node. Now I think, again, just because I haven't used it, I think you are kind of running a bit of a gamble at that point that it might reactivate a new branch for a bloom. So for more blooms to come up from a spent flower spike, or you can then generate, and I think there is a, uh, there's a word for it specifically. I can't remember, I don't know what the, the little pup might be, but you can start getting new leaves that are growing on here and some roots. And that is a pup essentially of this orchid because it's kind of stimulated that growth there. And what you would do is you'd let that grow in a bit more and then you would arguably kind of cut it off and then put it into its own growing media and grow it from there. Now, I think there's probably not that many people that have done this because it's a bit of an involved process and you kind of need to know, I guess, what you're doing with this or at least having done that once or twice. I don't know how many people would do it with a Phalaenopsis orchid, at least where I'm based, because it's relatively easily available in most shops, supermarkets even. And you can kind of tell how popular a plant is and how kind of common it is to find by the fact that it ends up in supermarkets nine times out of ten. So you could go through all of that rigmarole or you could potentially just go and buy an established large plant that's ready to bloom or is already blooming for not that much money. So I don't know whether or not people have done it. I would assume the people that have done it, I've done it for the joy of doing it and kind of seeing if it, if they can kind of do it. So it is one of those things that I've been meaning to do for a very, very long time, just because again, I would love to experience that. Have I got the time? And is this on the top of my priority list? Probably not. I've got too many orchids as it is. And my biggest problem when I propagate anything is I can't let go of my propagates. So I'm just like, I've got enough plants as it is. I don't need to create more plants to then take up even more space. <laughs> That's just me. That might not be you. That's just me. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's not the most straightforward thing if you don't know what you're doing. But I think based on kind of the description that I was just giving, if that is actually how you would do it, it's imagine you just need to get your head around it and just kind of get on with doing it as i said i because i've never done it i can't comment on how fast on how reliable all of these things if you have do let us all know down below so coming into availability with this one and i've touched on it a couple of times now yes it is a relatively easily available plant, at least in my part of the world. And I'm not just talking about the UK. I'm pretty sure I have seen this being kind of widely available in the majority of Europe. I mean, you can get this plant easily, even in places like in Greece and Cyprus, which, and the reason why I'm giving that as an example, A, because <laughs> family lives there, so I go there quite frequently, but also because we th that part of Europe, which is that bit warmer and drier, doesn't tend to get quite as many tropical plants being readily available to us because it's just not easy to kind of grow them in those slightly drier conditions. Not always dry, but and a lot of these things could also be grown on balconies or like in shaded kind of pergolas and things like that back home. But this is even one that you get there. So relatively easily accessible. There is a slight fluctuation in prices. At the moment, I can give you an indication with most orchids like and I'll give you the cheapest value, which would generally be a supermarket one, which is kind of single digits, single digits, mid, mid to high single digits for a relatively established plant. And I would say that in places like Greece, where it's still available, but less available than it might be over here, you might still get very large specimen type plants of this. And even here, actually, the, the huge kind of multiple plants in a pot so you get multiple things i'm thinking the kind of orchids that you might get in very expensive hotels and restaurants which are kind of showpieces those would be in the triple digits but most people with their houses 
probably wouldn't be buying that. I might be wrong, but probably wouldn't be buying that. They'd just be buying something like this. Even in Greece, you'd be looking at kind of very, very low double digits, basically. And it's just because it's still having a bit of a heyday there. And these used to be a bit more expensive back here as well when there was scarcity. And I know that this is a plant that, at least I remember reading this somewhere, this was a plant that they it, they couldn't propagate it as easily. And this might actually touch into the propagation section that I was doing a moment ago. Um, and Or maybe it wasn't reliable enough to be doing it in mass. And I think this was one of the big first successes in recent years of tissue culture. I might be wrong. But I'm pretty sure this was one of the successes of tissue culture to kind of grow them at volume and at speed to kind of get them to the level where they can easily be sold and they're kind of cheap and affordable. But yeah, relatively, it's a common house plant basically these days, at least as far as I can tell in Europe. I'd be curious if this is different where you live. Do let us all know down below. But yeah, relatively easy plant to find and not that expensive either. So coming into pests for this one, and I can be, and I am very happy to say that generally speaking, after how many years of owning these plants and them not being in high humidity situations, I very rarely have ever had any pests on this. You might see some, <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> and this was a, a pest that not everybody will have. So I don't know if you can kind of see the scratches on the leaves there. That is because where the orchids sit. So if my desk is here, I've got my pothos is here, my screen is there, the window is here, and Drusilla, which is my bearded dragon's kind of enclosure, is on the side there, essentially. So Drusilla, on a regular basis, will bang on the glass and want to be let out. And generally, she'll sit on my shoulders, she'll sit on my head a lot of the time whilst I'm doing work. But when she gets tired, she'll jump from my shoulder and go and land onto the orchids what you're seeing there are the nail marks from the lizard. And she'll just sit there and look out the window and rub a neck at all of the <laughs> rub a neck at all of the neighbors, essentially. <laughs> uh, there's a running joke that that, that um, what's the expression over here? I think it's is it called curtain twitcher, like the neighbor, the, usually the little old neighbors that are kind of opening, twitching their curtains just to see what all the neighbors are doing. It's because they are, yeah, they can't mind their own business. That is that lizard, basically. And she does it on the orchid. She will quite sit there quite happily on the orchid leaves. And you, it basically tells you how kind of rigid and succulent these leaves can be is that there's a bearded dragon sitting on them most of the time and they're fine. And to be fair, she has scratched some of these to no end. They just keep on keeping on. So that was <laughs> a pest that's relevant to my specific situation. <laughs> but generally speaking, I don't think I've ever had spider mites on mine. I don't think I have had thrips maybe but it never got out of hand you would imagine because the leaves are quite succulent the thrips generally for what i found with thrips is they tend to go for slightly more succulent leaves yes can i imagine mealybugs i've never had mealybugs on this but can i imagine mealybugs getting into the nooks and crannies of this possibly the only thing i will say about mealybugs is they will go to very soft tissue which is growing and at no stage maybe even when the new leaf is coming in is any part of this orchid that soft so they can kind of get their pinches in. So in my experience, generally pest free, I would say, but yeah. So coming into accessories and care for this plant, and I know that this might be the one that a lot of people might want to see is what do I do to keep them happy? And it's not massively complicated, I'm not going to lie. So you can see most of my orchids are in cash pose, which have no drainage poles, but they are in their own kind of nursery pots, essentially. What I will do is every, and this is key, every two to three years at a max, I'll replace the um, orchid bark that's in there, basically, and repot it into the same pot. I will remove any kind of rotting or dying roots that might be in the 
actual pod itself. And I will also make sure that any aerial roots, unless all the roots are rotted in the growing media, I will make sure that any roots that are not in the orchid bark stay out of the orchid bark again, because these are roots that are kind of more adept to not being in that growing media and it's more to be outside of this. The other thing that you will see sometimes, and I don't know whether or not that's going to focus there, can you see that this is slightly glaucous as well? What you will find a lot of the times with these orchids, and I'm trying to put it down so you can still see it, and there you go, is that when you get that kind of glaucousness on the roots, and spoiler, this is being filmed the day before it's watered, and this is one of the few plants that I still do have on a schedule, they will get more of that silveriness and blueness. As soon as they're wet, they are very kind of brightly green. And that could be another way that you could judge it. The problem that you have there is if you're judging when you need to water based on those aerial roots, they will dry out a lot faster than the growing media will. So generally speaking, find that happy point with your orchids. A lot of the times my house plants, and this is a bit of a spoiler, and I know I'm always talking about the fact of don't have your plants on a schedule. If it's a plant that I've never dealt with before, generally speaking, even if it's something like a fern, I will start with, I'm going to water it today. I've just got it. Don't know anything about this plant. I'm going to water it today and I'm going to water it again in a week. And I'll judge it over the first few weeks to see, does it need more frequent watering? Is it struggling because it's drying out too quickly? Or is it really not drying out within that week and do I need to make it longer or the kind of, and judge it that way. I will find that's usually the place where I'll start is one week. And let's see, one week between waterings. But these have stayed on a week watering for years now. What I would normally do then is I would take regular tap water. Please, for the love of all that is holy, do not do the ice cube thing. I don't know where I saw this as a tip. And I'm just like, when people put ice cubes <laughs> on top of that. Tropical plant. There is no ice where it grows naturally. Why would you want to put something like... I get the theory behind it is that you would put the ice and as it slowly melts, it will water that kind of growing media and the roots. It's freezing cold water. Even when it's melting, it is very, very cold water. Think about all the other plants that you might have in your collection. When do you ever give them ice cold water? Never, because you might shock the roots and you probably will shock the roots. But what you would do with this one, I keep putting it down. Um, I'd, I usually will fill this in with water. I don't even put the liquid fertilizer into the watering can water before I put it in. I just directly like put a couple of drops and I use, and I've been very successful with this and I know you can't get this everywhere. I use the pink baby bio liquid fertilizer, which is the, the orchid fertilizer. Two or three drops every single time I water in the water and I will fill this cash pot as everything is sitting in there and I will let it sit in that water for about 20, 30 minutes. And after those 20, 30 minutes, and because I've got so many, I'll do them all at the same time. After those 20, 30 minutes, I will pull the pot out of the cash pot like this. I will usually over a sink, make sure that it drains off as much of that water as is possible, and then dump out all the water, pop it back in, and put it back in its place. It's as simple as that. The other thing I will say, and I got into the habit of doing it every week, but a friend's mum actually told me, and she's just like, oh, like a lot of the times my orchids and hers flower and do all these things quite regularly. If I'm going away, yes, they're on relatively frequent watering, like maybe once a week, once every two weeks. But I've left the orchids, I've watered them well, like maybe left them in the water for like half an hour before I go away for a two-week holiday. Do not water them at all whilst I'm away, obviously, for the two-week holiday, come back. And as long as I water them within a, a day or two of getting back, they're fine. So for the people that do go on trips on a regular basis, this is still not necessarily a bad option because a lot of people will be like, you know, uh, sensitive areas, all of these things are great for people that are traveling all the time because they don't have a lot of watering needs. As long as you're not doing it all the time and you're just a normal person that might go on two or three trips in a year that might be for a week or two away, this is great because you don't, this is not going to be one of those plants that you're going to have when you get people coming around to water your plants. If you're only going away for a week or two, this isn't one that you're going to have to tell them to water. It can quite happily survive. At least it has done so in my experience in that way, basically. So, and that is pretty much it. I don't spray the leaves. I don't do anything else. That is it. 
The other thing I will say, and this is something that I have discovered sometimes, I don't know if you can kind of see the new leaf there, but it kind of comes out in this kind of cup, almost boat shape. And I will say, try not to get any water that pools in there because then you might get crown rot. So essentially you might get rot from the top of the plant going down. So just make sure, and it's kind of done in a way that it's got a little channel for you. Just when you're tipping the water out, just make sure that any water that might be pooling in that location is kind of dumped out as well. And that's all you need to do. And it does fine. Yes, should I probably dust the leaves? Probably. Have I ever dusted the leaves on some of these plants? Probably not in eight years. Would they grow a bit faster? Maybe. Do I care enough? Probably not. <laughs> and they do fine. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't harm them. But yes, you probably should dust your leaves. Oh, Nikki from Plants, Pots and What's Not, who sits there and like kind of cleans all her leaves. I wish I had your dedication. And I'm so envious. I wish I could. But, and she is completely right. You should clean your leaves. But uh, I ain't got no time for that. Um, but yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to say about this care. Like there isn't anything that extraordinary about its care as long as you kind of do these things. And to be fair, from the people that I know that generally have success with their orchids, a lot of them, when I've spoken to them, they do something very similar to what I do. I know there's been some variation in that as well, but I'd be curious if you've always had success with Phalaenopsis orchids, do you do things differently than me? I'm curious. But yeah, let's move on to the final topic. So coming into final thoughts for this one, and I'll do the thing that I usually do where I say that if I didn't have this plant and I'm knowing what I know now after having it for so many years, would I purchase it? Probably. Would I only purchase one or two? Probably yes. And actually, that's a point I did want to touch on is should I probably reduce my collection? Yes. However, there's something that's really interesting that will happen not all of them will flower at the same time. So because I've got multiples, what generally happens is uh, there is never a point in the year where I do not have at least one of my orchids in bloom. So for the people, and I know this isn't necessarily a solution, for the people that are really into the blooms and less so about the foliage, if you get multiples and get them, don't get them all at the same time because the reality is they might then all bloom at the same time again, Get one now, get one in two or three months time, get one in two or three months after that and get like four, maybe five. And then depending on how they bloom, and I know that might not be exactly right, they might all end up blooming at the same time, but you should get some staggering that's happening. And then you've always got at least an orchid to enjoy it being in bloom. I think at the moment there are four of my Phalaenopsis orchids all in bloom at the same time. So... The other little tip that I will give, and it's something that's usually sold as a mini Phalaenopsis orchid, which the blooms are a lot smaller, the plant is a bit smaller, looks very similar. I don't think it's technically a Phalaenopsis, I might be wrong. I think there's been some debate about this, is that might be an entirely different species. I don't think it's a different genera, I think it's a different species. But that one, and anybody that I know, same as me, that has got that, that plant I have had for seven years, it has never once not been in bloom, not have a flower spike with blooms on it once. It has always had something on there. So that's a top tip there. I think I would definitely get this just because I still enjoy them. I probably wouldn't have as many, maybe two, maybe two, just to kind of get blooms happening a bit more frequently, basically. And now in terms of giving it a score, zero or one being the worst, 10 being the best. And this might surprise people. I would probably... In my experience, I would probably give this an eight or a nine. And this I'm talking about for people that are really into their blooms, who maybe don't have as many house plants as me. This is an easy plant. And again, it's it's the thing that people just, oh, I find orchids really difficult. Rephrasing that slightly, I think would sit better with me. You might have difficulties getting an orchid to bloom, but a lot of the times when I've seen people and they just I have it's such a difficult plant, I can never get it happy. They can't get it happy enough to bloom. The leaves are still fine. There's a slight difference there, if that makes sense. The plant is still okay. It's not thriving necessarily. I don't think... 
does it need to be thriving in order to bring out blooms? Not necessarily, but you know what I mean. It's You can still keep an orchid happy. It just might not be in bloom for you, basically. But I do think this is a good one to kind of test out. And it's not... And as long as you get that care just right, it's a relatively low fuss plant. It doesn't, as I said, there's not that many pests on it. There's, it's not that expensive generally around here. Does it need high humidity? No. Does it need, ah, oh, that's the one thing I did want to say, and I should have said this in the care, but I'll say it now. I give this the same amount of light that I would give a cactus. I give this really, really bright light. And the one thing that I will say about that is, and this is something that can work for people is, they have it by a very bright window, and then when it blooms, they bring it further into the house, maybe where it doesn't get as much light, just to enjoy those blooms, and then put it back when the blooms drop towards that bright light, so it can essentially recharge like a battery. The one thing I would say, I have tried that once or twice. I find the blooms, when I do that and bring it away from the light, don't last anywhere near as much as if I just left it on the window where it's getting the, the light level that it obviously needs. So yeah, but generally, yeah, high scores for this one. I'd be curious to see your reviews down below or kind of what score you would give it. Yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon. And I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.